Rebuilding a Stuart Models Twin Launch Model Steam Engine Part 9, making a start on the new crankshaft and only a small amount of painting. But what's this? Do I have an ocular malfunction? Am I seeing double? There are two crankshafts here, yes indeed. And for all the viewers who saw the video called The Trouble with Model Steam Engines, you will remember that I dismantled a damaged, badly made double 10 V. What's really funny about this is people have put, ah, oh, so it worked, and then you broke it and threw it in a drawer. Uh, well, yes, I did, really. I would just like to mention that I would never repair a crankshaft of this size. By the time I've messed about with it, drilled it, pinned it, etc, etc, and then found out that it's not true in the first place, it's easier and quicker to make a new one. So that's what I'm going to be describing in this video. This is the first part. In this clip I'm using a micrometer to check the diameter of the journals and there's already something wrong. The double 10 V crankshaft should have shaft diameters of 9 30 seconds of an inch, but both of these crankshafts have a shaft diameter of 5 16 of an inch, which on a Stuart double 10 V is not correct. And that explains the unorthodox construction, because the diameter of the crankshaft is too big to fit in the crankwebs on a double 10 V. But first, a very short painting interlude. This week something's happened with my YouTube channel, I'm getting a lot more hits, and it's about time really, because I've been making these videos for quite a while, and not really getting that many hits on them, but that's all changed for the moment. I would think that the figures will slip back to a lot less than they are at the moment, and it's been nice for a short while, being a popular YouTuber, and it's been quite interesting getting a lot of extra comments from viewers. Some of them good, some of them really good, and some of the comments have started the voices off again. So anyway, I'm taking a lot more medication, and I find myself cleaning my small collection of Viking battle axes far more frequently. It's time to take a few simple measurements to find out what the throw is on the crankwebs of each of the crankshafts. Obviously on the Stuart 10V, it's less than on the Stuart Twin Launch. I also need to know the length of each of the crankshafts. Here I'm measuring the Twin Launch one, and this one is a good bit longer than the Stuart Double 10 v as you can see here. I'm about to cut the piece of silver steel that I bought last week into the lengths for the two crankshafts. And to do this I'm going over to my large bandsaw which is in a very dark part of the workshop. I don't mean dark as in a dark place, I mean dark because the light is not switched on. This is my very crappy bandsaw, I've had it for years and years and years, and it was not good when I bought it, and it's not got any better over the years, but it does the job, it cuts pieces of metal. I bought a new blade for it, and as you can see, it cuts pieces of metal quite well. Health and safety warning as usual, when using machines like this, please keep your fingers out of the way, because it's the metal you want to cut. You do not necessarily need to shorten any of your fingers, and as you can clearly see, when my fingers are near the blade, the bandsaw is not running. So that's one crankshaft cut, now for the second one. Here are a couple of common sense rules. Measure twice, cut once, and also, when you're doing a job like this, cut over size, because you're going to have to machine the end to get a good finish. Here's the bit I had left over, going in my bits and pieces box. I'm making these two crankshafts using silver steel, because silver steel is accurately ground to the correct size, and also it's very hard wearing. But for the moment I'm putting the double 10 V crankshaft back in the drawer, because I'm not going to make two at once, it will get far too confusing. To make this crankshaft I'm going to use the smaller of my two lathes. Here it is, my old Boxford lathe. And one day I may even clean it up. This is in the right hand corner of the workshop, and in case anyone is wondering what's in the glass cabinet to the right of the picture, these are Hammond organ and Leslie speaker parts, which are nothing whatsoever to do with making a small crankshaft for a model steam engine. The blue box on the left of the picture is a transwave converter, which converts single phase into three phase to operate the machine. The first job is to face off the end of the piece of bar. I'm taking a very small cut, I could take a heavier cut, but I don't want to shorten the crankshaft too much. When I cut these two pieces of silver steel on the bandsaw in the previous section, I cut them approximately one eighth of an inch oversize. And the overall length of the crankshaft is relatively unimportant, I could have left it oversize, but I'm doing this facing cut to clean it up and remove the saw marks, and now I'm drilling the end of the bar with a centre drill, to give the illusion of the bar having been turned between centres. 
Full-size crankshafts generally have a centre hole in the end of the shaft, and if I was making this crankshaft in the lathe from a casting, then the centre hole would be functional to hold it in line while I turned it. But I really don't think my lifespan is long enough to turn a crankshaft from a casting. It's something I've never done, I've never needed to do. And I've made some pretty big crankshafts and some very small crankshafts using this built-up method, and it always works. And for all the experts watching, fingers twitching over the keyboard to contradict me, I am making a crankshaft, a model crankshaft for a model steam engine. I am not making a steam turbine. I am not making an internal combustion engine that does thousands of RPM. The reason for the failure of this crankshaft and the one on the double 10 V is simply that they weren't made well enough. You have to make them properly. And now the next part is making the crank webs. I do have the drawings for this engine, but I can't show them in the video because it would be copyright infringement. And I do believe that copyright laws in America and England are very different, or so I'm told. Luckily, I have the original crankshaft to work from. So taking the measurements from this and looking at the drawing, which is to the left of me out of the picture, I need to cut the crank webs to one inch. That's slightly oversized, but it will be fine. So I simply scribe a line. Then it's over to the bandsaw to chop this piece of steel into crank web sized pieces. I do apologise for the wobbly video. It's not me wobbling the camera, it's actually the bandsaw moving about because the stand it's on is very flimsy. And also in an attempt to prevent any viewers from entering a vegetative state or slipping into a coma, I've speeded up the video. Once the crank web pieces have been cut, I just touch them on my one inch belt sander to remove any rough edges. The next part of the operation is very critical in the making of the crankshaft, so you must do this. Always take off the rough edges. This clip shows four nicely cleaned up, but not accurate, pieces of crank web. The next part of the operation is to make these crank webs exactly the same length as each other. Here I'm just playing with the pieces to show you the general arrangement, which is pretty similar to the crankshaft on the right. Except, of course, that when the one on the left is finished, it will be far more accurate than the one on the right. Here are the metal parts ready for machining into crank webs. And if you look at the dimensions, you will see that they are over an inch. They are a sixteenth of an inch oversize. This is my well-used, well-worn, well-damaged machine vise that sits on my milling machine. And what I'm doing is cleaning it. This paintbrush is used for getting rid of all traces of swarf because a piece of swarf in the wrong place will make this job inaccurate. There are two things wrong with this clip. One is using a really rough piece of metal to pack the parts up on the machine vise and the other one is the way the pieces are positioned in the machine vise. This is a better way to do it. The two pieces of metal used as packing strips are new pieces of metal that are not marked or distorted and I'm positioning the components ready for machining across the machine vise so they're held in compression by the jaws of the vise. This clip shows me using a soft hammer to tap the pieces into place. The machine vise is not fully tightened, and this ensures that the pieces are firmly down onto the packing strips. The next thing to do is to change the milling cutter. This one's a little bit on the small side. Normally in this machine, I use a drill chuck for milling operations, but for any serious milling operations where I don't want to destroy the part, I would always use a Clarkson milling chuck. These are very high quality devices and hold the milling cutters very securely. There is no chance of the milling cutter working loose and falling out. The collet holder is tightened up using this special spanner. Hardly able to contain my excitement, it's milling time. Quite important really to take fine cuts. I'm not using any coolant or lubricant on this and I should be really because it's steel. But then again, if I do that, it's going to splash it everywhere, all over my camera and I don't want to do that. So I'm doing it dry, which I suppose you can do it dry, but take it easy if you do. It will blunt the tool far more quickly than if you use a lubricant. Here is a sensible health and safety warning. Well, as sensible as I can make it. Industrial type coolant lubricants are very nasty. They're not suitable for use in the home workshop. And I'm told they are carcinogenic, which is not good. The idea is to build steam engines and not to die horrifically of some incurable disease that's been caused by using industrial lathe coolant lubricant in the home workshop. On screen at the moment is the continuation of the milling operation. And what I did first was I took a very fine cut across the top of the pieces of metal. And then I found I hadn't taken quite a deep enough cut. So I went back and took a deeper cut. And here's the second pass. 
A few years ago, when I was a computer engineer, I used to go out to firms fixing computers and networks and things. And I used to visit a machine tool company in Halifax who made gigantic machine tools for turning railway engine wheels. And I used to talk to an old chap there who'd been there forever, most of his life, and his job was to mill the lathe beds. And these lathe beds were about 20 or 30 feet long. And he would be taking a 10 thou cut all the way down, about the same speed as I'm doing. Now that is what you call patience. As the pieces come off the milling machine, they have burrs on them. These need to be removed before the continuation of the operation. I'm about to reverse these pieces in the machine vise, and if they had burrs on like this, they would not sit accurately in position. Also, I'm taking out the two metal bars, cleaning them thoroughly with a paintbrush to get rid of all traces of swarf, and then cleaning the machine vise itself too. Generally, my workshop is very messy, but certain areas of the workshop, like the machine vise, horrible as it looks, I need to keep clean. And as I mentioned earlier, any pieces of swarf in the wrong place will severely affect the accuracy of the job. As before, I'm positioning the pieces in line with the machine vise so that when the machine vise jaws are clamped up, it clamps the larger surface area of the pieces together. And once again, I'm using the milling cutter to also machine this side of the crankweb blanks. But this time, I've speeded up the video. And after cleaning off the burrs left by the milling cutter on my one inch belt sander, I then finally cleaned up the pieces of metal on some wet or dry sandpaper, this is 400 grit. And I'm going up and down, although many people have told me I should go round and round, or in a figure of eight, or even in a letter S or letter P formation. Thinking about it, you know, ever since I had the electric shock therapy, I do seem to clean up pieces of metal like I show in the video. It's time now to refer to the drawing. I've blurred out the drawing so you can't see it. And what I'm going to ask, beginners only please, not experts, I know the answer, but for beginners only, is how do you determine the dimension from the centre of the crankshaft line to the centre of the crank pin? It is not written on the drawing. Shock horror, how do you do it? And while everybody is feverishly typing on the keyboard to tell me about it, here is my old forge or chuck from the Boxford lathe, and I call it Bernard. And pretty much like me, very old, but some parts still work. The idea of a four-jaw chuck, for raw beginners, is that you can independently adjust the jaws to hold irregular-shaped objects, or position pieces of metal that are regular-shaped in a different position. And this is what I'm going to be doing in the next episode, showing how I machine these pieces of metal that I've just been cutting. And also in the next episode, I'm going to need these, a ruler and a centre punch. Here, I'm just trying the piece of crankshaft material in the main bearings to see how it fits. Obviously the crankshaft material is accurately ground, and it fits quite well in the main bearings. Here's a top tip, this is not just a gratuitous shot of a barco adjustable spanner. It's to show people who do not have one of these, this of course is a micrometer, this is a digital micrometer, but you don't need one. You can use a barco adjustable spanner as a micrometer. As you see, you can size things and get a good idea whether they're the same size by the feel of a precision adjustable spanner. And there you have it, another good use for a barco adjustable spanner. I'm going to conclude this episode with some more painting, because I know a lot of you out there like painting, and I don't really know why. But anyway, I'm painting the inside surface of the mounting base for the engine with some red Humbrol paint. On smaller model locomotives, I do like the fact that most of them are painted red in between the frames, so I thought I'd do the same with this mounting base and see what it looked like. And I think it's going to look okay. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.